and welcome to the latest episode of Off The Fence. This is your go-to digital jump show week in, week out, leading up to the Cheltenham Festival in association with Ball Sports. And why am I so excited today? Because this is our Cheltenham Festival preview show. We are going to be going through all four days of the festival. We've been leading up to it all winter long. And now I get to sit and dissect the races with Barry Garrity and Tony Keenan. And this is going to have all the information that you need. Trust me, this is the only preview show you need in your life right now. Uh, isn't that right, Tony Keenan? No, click them all to hell. Give them all a few clicks there. We, we, all, we all know that <laughs> people watch, watch every single one of them. Um, I know, no, to, 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 this, to, this is the best of them. And you know what? This is one of the best uh, Cheltenham festivals in a while. I, I'm really looking forward to this one. I think it's a um, very competitive year. Maybe the, the, the shortage of really short price ones and has been in the last few years. I think all the championship races are either uh, open or have superstars in them like Constitution Hill or and Shishkin and to the novice races just look highly competitive and sure, as usual the handicaps are, are, are wide open so um, very good four days ahead I think Love it we've kicked off with a bit of positivity from Tony Keane and Barry are you as enthused by this year's Cheltenham Festival as ever? Oh definitely yeah and, and for all the reasons Tony mentioned um, some real superstars potential superstars um, competitive novices but even the, the, the feature races you know they're, they're, they're stacked with quality so no, it's, it looks like it's going to be really competitive Brilliant well we are going to kick off very shortly but before we kick off with day one of the Cheltenham Festival do not forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel that way you won't miss a single episode and you won't want to because during the Cheltenham Festival we will be doing preview shows the night before every single day and those are going to be must watches so hit subscribe right now but let's get into it. We're going to be going through in chronological order and we're going to do the majority of the graded, the grade ones really. And then at the end, we'll be doing handicaps and a few other dark horses, all of that sort of thing. So Tuesday, day one, into the Supreme, Fasal Vega, two to one with Ball Sports currently, Marine Nationale, seven to two. Those are the two up at the top of the market. Impera Pass, four to one. Uh, Tamaris in there for the UK representatives at tens, Hunter's Yarn, twelves. Obviously, these are the prices as we're recording currently. But let's go to you first, Barry. I think we will kick off with you. Mouthwatering clash, so many question marks, specifically on the basis that Fasal Vega was beaten when we last saw him. Tw Talk to us about the Supreme. Well, that's, the, that's I suppose, the starting point. Fasal Vega having bombed out at Leopardstown. You know, will he have recovered from that run? He was also lame during the week after it. Um, but then as well, he has to settle on the day. And that's a big if. Um, he's been very keen on front. Um, people said, you know, Willie has dictated this race in the past, but I don't think he's one of those horses. I think he's he might be just a bit too keen going. Um, Ella Tet Thompson has been really consistent, won the grade one the last day, sets a good standard. And if uh, Fasal Vegas has struggled, he's possibly the one to beat. Um, but there's a horse I've liked all the way through, um, strong leader of Ollie Murphy's. He was beaten by uh, Canto Bruno in a bumper in Cheltenham early in the season when he came from way off the pace and he was the only horse who did. Um, he's three from three over hurdles. Didn't get to compete in a top level race with the kennel get called off and he didn't run the tall work because of himself. But he's a horse I've liked. Um, he's from a good family, strong flow, Paul Nichols, old chaser. So I think he's a, one of the fancy price. But for me, Ila Tete Tom probably sets the standard with a big question mark over Fasal Vega. Okay, well, Lilla to Thomas is 11 to 2, but strong leader is 25 to 1 currently with Ball Sports. So we have kicked off with a bang. Over to you, Tony Keenan. How are you playing the Supreme? Um, in a small way, it's, I actually can't believe Barry has talked <laughs> about this horse. I, I actually give this horse a bit of a chance as well. Um, I thought that I'd be the only one fancying it. Um, no, I, I, it's, it's not a race ah. I'm going to be, be, be having a, a strong bet in. Um, I, th I think it's very difficult. I would be against Fasal Vega. I think Barry summed it up well um, just after the Dublin Racing Festival. It's hard to put the genie back in the bottle with his keenness and tactics. And also people maybe now know that if you do race up with him, it may set him alight and, and cause him a few issues. Of the ones at the front end of the market, I, I would lean towards Marine Nationale. Um, he, the fact that he's unbeaten and, and going the right way is a big help. The fact that he was able to make the jump from Maidens into a, a Grade 1, a strongly run Grade 1, again, is a very good sign. Battleground and he faced at Fairy House would also be a help. And also, I, I'm sure people saw this, Barry Connors' interview on um, 
Sky Sports Racing there last week. God, he oh, wouldn't yeah. strike me as... Oh, yeah, jeez Louise. Yeah, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't strike me as a man that does hype o- over the years in a confidence, maybe, but uh, this was extreme confidence. So that would, would definitely give you um, a, a bit of positivity if you were thinking of back him. So he'd be the one at the front end. I'd also probably be tricking about with a few at prices. Strong leader is the one that I actually like most of the English horses. Um, I thought that bumper that he ran behind in Canto Bruno was a complete mess and he did very well to finish second and he's done everything right in his three starts since that. I thought the entry in particular he was good. The type of horse now that is finishing out his race strongly so it'd give him a chance. Um, I think Dr Bravo has a little bit of a chance as well. I think if he had a one in Goran and he probably was the best horse in the race uh, looking back that things went wrong for him in front a bit soon and made quite a bad mistake um, two out. You know, he was well in at the weights, but I, I think he'd be a little bit short or if things had unfolded a little bit better for him. And I also think Devere just got a bit of a chance. And I know I'm giving you four separate horses there, but that, that's kind of the way I'd be approaching it. Kind of small stakes on a few rather than having one uh, single strong opinion on the race. OK, we like having options. I'm sure our viewers will too. And viewers do get involved in the comment box below. Who do you fancy in the Supreme? Do you agree with Barry? Do you like one of Tony's horses? I'm all about high definition in this. I'm, and people may laugh. But I'm hoping that it'll have got his jumping together and class may shine through on the day. Uh, let's move on to the Arkle. And I think many people, Tony, see this as a clash between John Bond and El Fabiolo. And this has been brewing for a long time now and it looks like it's going to come to fruition. Are you focusing in at the top of the market for the Arkle? Yeah, I think so. Dice of Dino's next in there in the in the betting, but he's kind of at three goals now at grade one level and hasn't been able to win any of them. So no, I, I'd be keen on El Fabiolo. There is a chance he, he'll, he'll crack off a fence, but I think on ability, I'm, I'm quite happy to play him. Uh, the market has kind of swung back in favour of John Bond now in the last um, fortnight or so, but I think as Faris has mentioned before, El Fabiolo, you could definitely make a case he was the best horse in the entry, and I think in terms of pure form, what he's achieved over fences this season, that the Leperstown run is the standout performance. So I, I think he's very solid and be quite happy with him. Yeah, me too. I was confident on him a few weeks ago, and I'm not abandoning him now, Barry. He's 11 to 8, John Bon is 6 to 4, Dysart Dynamo is 9 to 2, and Senwa in there at 8. Bambridge, obviously, expecting him to go over further. He's in there at 10s currently. Uh, where are you with me and Tony with the El Fabiolo bandwagon? I'm flip flopping to my own mind between them all, really. Um, <laughs> El Fabiolo, he was brilliant at the Dublin Racing Festival, but his jumping still needs to improve, and Cheltenham is a trickier track. Um, than Leopardstown, if you like. Big fences in Leopardstown, but they come at you generally in a straight line where Cheltenham, you're turning and jumping. They're very tricky downhill fence, the, for, uh, the one down the back, the third last, the ditches can be difficult. Like, he's he's not straightforward. He's a classy horse. Um, and then you have John Bond, who didn't run to the expectations, you could say, in Warwick, like he, he did last season in Haydock before he was second in the Supreme. So there's question marks over them. They're two very good horses. And I was probably with John Bon um, because his jumping was maybe more bankable than El Fabiolo. But I'm just wondering about Dysart Dynamo um, as an each way bet. Um, the track would probably suit him better. Sharpen, a sharper track, turn and jumping. Has jumped really well. Um, he might just get it his own way a little bit better on front. He might just get running as much. Um, with Paul Townend, who I think would probably ride him if Daryl Jacobs stays in El Fabiolo. Um, it could suit him, but I think he'd, he'd be good value in each way play. Um, with, and it's probably unfair to say, slight question marks with John Bond running below par maybe last time and El Fabiolo's jumping on a track like Cheltenham, just not fully con- confirmed, if you like. OK, dice that dynamo with the each way squeak then. Uh, Barry, let's stick with you for the champion hurdle. This is it, Constitution Hill. Uh, we, this is what we've been talking about since, obviously, this same day last year when he did what he did in the Supreme, and we got to reflect on that together. And now, fingers crossed, 10, well, we, yeah, 10 days to go as we, as we record this now, it looks as though he's going to line up in the champion hurdle and take all the beating. He's two to seven in the market currently with Ball Sports. Just give us the inside track on him. What has been the word on the street from the inside? How happy are connections with Constitution Hill? Yeah, no, word is very good. They're very happy with him. You saw him galloping in Kempton. He gave a head start and he came home well clear. Um, so like everything's been really, I suppose it's touch wood it's going, you couldn't have gone any smoother for him. Uh, his performance in the Supreme last year to break the, the champion hurdle track record on his third start was, was amazing. And then he's he's backed it up this season with his performance in the fighting fifth and the Christmas hurdle. So um, 
yeah he's definitely he's he's one i'm very excited about anyway um but as the race itself um i suppose statement looks his obvious danger but i like um i like to move it i thought he ran a big race when winning the the king well hurdle and when canton last time had disappointed in the red keel over two and a half and soft ground previous to that but was a good winner at the great wood before that so he has good course form i think he's good value maybe each way um against constitution hill um statement could just possibly lose second place to a horse like him if he was to make the running and be taken on by constitution hill so um i think there could be value in maybe getting on a leg to move it in the place market um, and probably before declarations when you have eight and plus runners because it could shrink down below that so um obviously full of uh, full of belief in constitution hill but i think a value in a leg to move it as a side note, just uh, we, this is betting focused and we're trying to find you winners and angles in. And we love that angle that I like to move it. But I must can't really go on without asking you in regards to Constitution Hill. When you're riding in a race where you've got a horse that looks so far ahead of everyone else is such a short price and everyone's expecting to bolt up on a horse at those bigger prices in, beh- in behind the likes of I like to move it, Zana here, even horses that are much bigger priced on the day. In a champion hurdler, are you always riding to win? Or is there a case of, look, we're not going to get near Constitution Hill. Let him and Stateman do their business up front and try pick up the pieces in the places. Or is that not the case in a champion hurdle? I know you will keep you'll keep as close of uh, touch with the leaders as you can. But, you know, if you take your horse out of your comfort zone, say jump with the third last, you've got very little chance of winning at that stage or running well. So you'll try and conserve the finish. But you will you won't be uncompetitive through a champion hurdle and being competitive at the death. So you will have to you'll have to be involved, but you might just have to hang on to a little bit, as I say, over the third last second, not get stuck into it um at that stage because you will you'll pay the price then and you mightn't just get up the hill. So it's you probably have to box a little bit clever. Um but yeah, you you will you'll be involved though. Okay, good to know. Uh, Tony, over to you. Are we just Constitution Hill through and through here? Although I know you well enough to know that uh, at that sort of price, he's probably not your horse in this race or your way of playing the race anyway. Um, no, he, he probably will win. The only opinion I would have, betting-wise on it, was that you'd be putting state man into each way multiples um, any chance you get between now and then, provided the final declarations aren't made and you've still got eight in the race. So that would be the only way I'd play it, I think, is place part of the each way bet would look to be serious value still at this moment in time okay place part um tony let's stick with you for the mayor's hurdle then because this really is a cracking renewal and uh, viewers out there and listeners get involved let us know what you think is going to win the mayor's hurdle because it is competitive right down to much bigger prices but up at the top of the market of course we have honeysuckle the seven to four favorite mary's rocking there at three to one epitons at 100 to 30 brandy love at fives envoy allen sixes echoes and rain sevens queensbrook is tens and she wears it well is 12 so those are the top few in the market obviously there might be some diversions but we expect the majority of those to line up tony and please unpick the mayor's hurdle for me i i genuinely wouldn't be able to have a bet in this race as we speak right now because i just every time i go through it i land on a different horse yeah the, the one i wouldn't land on now is honeysuckle i, I do think she is, is is going back with um at the moment i didn't like the way that she um I think her form has dipped a little bit since the initial uh, champion hurdle season. She was very good throughout last year, but just not quite as good and just seems to have dipped again this season. Didn't come forward from Fairy House really to the Dublin Racing Fest, so we keen enough to take her on. Um, would have had Mary's Rock in mind for this for a while, but it sounds like she's not going now. And judging by the exchange, I think she's nearly out to a double figure price for this. Um, be less cold and appetent, just the price is a bit meh. Um, she's fine, she has a chance. Um, Brandy Love was okay in punches times, tight turnaround. I'd lean towards Echoes and Rain, it wouldn't be a massively strong opinion. Uh, I do think her form has probably improved since they've taken the bit of gear off her and that. Um, very progressive on the flat over the summer. Was still travelling okay when she came down to out in the Hatton's Grace, then a, a very easy win in Nace. Trip might stretch her a little bit, but She's a strong steer over two miles on the flat, so I'd give her a bit of a chance there. Um, I'd prefer to see Paul Town and Donner, um, although suspecting maybe on Brandy Love, I just think she's been settling a bit better for him than for Paddy Mullins, but we, we'll see on that. Okay, Echoes and Rain is currently sevens with ball sports. Um, what about you, Barry? Who would you like to be siding with in the Mayor's Hurdle? 
I'd be the opposite, Tony. I, I'd be very sweet in honeysuckle. Um, I think she's just crying out for further. Um, leopard sound there was decent ground. They didn't go overly quick. Um, she was. She just it looked as if she didn't have the pace that she had last season. As I mentioned before, I thought she ran a good race in the Hatton's Grace. Um, but obviously Cheltenham spring bit of sun on her back, likely to get good ground. Yeah, I I think she's the one to beat. Um, Epitant could go here, but I don't see any reason why she should turn form and her having been beaten by her in a couple of champion hurdles uh, Love Envy is there would have to have a chance as well and Brandy Love has to be of interest too um, the fact that Willie he felt he had to run her in Punchestown it was going the wrong way she's going to be better left handed and she is the only mare to beat have beaten Love Envy and beat her well in Ferrios obviously going the wrong way that day as well so she'd have to have some form of squeak because it was unusual for Willie to run one so soon between you know so close to the two Cheltenham having their first run of the season he didn't do what appreciated last year maybe he regretted that um but I think Brandy Love she ran a good race considering she would have needed the run and gave away probably most of her chance at the last one going left-handed so she's of interest but I'm very much sweet on, on Honeysuckle up and trip okay that's the key is it honeysuckle up and trip my goodness the roof would come off the place and that's cliche but it really would on the tuesday if she was to win the mayor's hurdle uh barry let's stick with you for the last race that we're covering on the tuesday national hunt chase gaylord de Manil has been at the top of this market for a long time now he's 11 to 10 as we speak with ball sports romilly's next best 100 to 30 marla mission at sixes and church don't worry also the same price six to one chemical energy is in there at 13 to two mr coffee eight city chief nine that's the top few in the betting obviously we could see a few diversions again but um, is it just Gaylord de Manil if he lines up here he wins this Barry I think he is the one to beat but I'll you know, be honest he's probably a horse who doesn't really excite me he's a second season novice um, having said uh-huh. that what's going to beat him uh, it's, it's hard to pick the one to beat him but so he probably is the likely winner um, I thought Mr Coffee was interesting uh, with Derek O'Connor having a sit in him recently in your Toxer, he uh, finished second in a handicap there. He was unlucky not to win the Kim Muir last year. Um, he's only had one run or two runs, sorry, this season. Um, he was second twice. Um, but I thought he'd be of interest each way. In probably what isn't the competitive, most competitive race, and maybe Gerda de Mesnil is a worthy favourite. But as I say, he just doesn't really fully excite me. No, I think I think a lot of people could agree with that comment. And Tony, we know that's not where you're going here. Marla Mission at sixes and Churchstone Warrior, both of them the same price now, but they've been on your radar for a very long time. Are you abandoning either of them now? Oh no, I'm not. Uh, like I've somehow managed to finish up with the National Hunt Chase in my biggest position at the whole meeting, which is certainly wasn't the plan. <laughs> it, 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 it is like a, could do could do with one of these two winning now. Um, certainly wasn't the plan, but. Kind of finished up after Christmas, just liking the two of these. Um, I was hoping Gayard de Mani uh, wouldn't turn up, but sure, but he's there. He's fine. He, he like um, you know, but he, he's not. He's absolutely not unbeatable because he he doesn't win the races possibly that he should have um, over the years. And both of those are, I suppose, less exposed. Um, I'd be convinced that the two of them will will be better over this type of trip. They, they do look pretty. Um, slow is probably the abrupt way of saying it, but stay stay in types anyway. Um, Manor Mission's jumping now, I suppose, has been really exceptional in the last three starts, given where he was coming from the run back at Cheltenham in November, where he didn't jump at all well, um, or Cheltenham or October maybe it was, but he's been excellent since then. Um, Church don't worry, or the issue with him if, is if he can get him over the first uh, five or six fences because he does tend to jump a bit stickily early, but if he can. His jumping has improved as the race has gone on both at Leperstown and in the 10 up last time. So I'm hopeful both of those can give um, Gayard the Menina race. And as, as Barry's mentioned, like, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be a big field. Um, don't think it's going to cut up quite as much as the Statler race last year, but it might not be far off it. Okay, interesting indeed. And keeping the confidence with your two, we wish you luck. Tony, uh, that was day one of the Cheltenham Festival done and dusted let's rock and roll on to day two the Wednesday and we will kick off with the Ballymore and do not forget everyone get involved write your comments I've read a few of the comments back and sometimes it's very hit and miss with you guys out there um, but we do appreciate your feedback and most importantly we want to hear what you're saying about these races who are your selections so do get involved but Tony we will stick with you for the Ballymore very competitive Hermes Allen still at the top of the market 9-4 to four. in Sarah Pass, threes, Gaelic Warrior, fours, Goodland, nine to two, Champ Kylie, 13 to two. Um, Tony, 
I mean, it is very competitive, but it feels like there might not be an absolute standout in here. Is that fair to say? I don't know. I, I think we might find out on the day. There's a few here that um, would have the potential to, to go even higher. It does look, the, to me, the strongest of the three novice, traditional novice orders, excluding the Triumph. Looks, looks a really good race. Um, Hermes Allen, I was quite impressed with him at Newbury, but it was a race a little bit that fell apart. I, I know the form in theory is working out, but how many of them really ran the race that day? The second in the tour maybe just about ran the race and nothing else has turned up in the, in, in the really bad weather and, and the, the very slow ground. So I, I don't know about him. He, he looks short enough to me. Imperia Pass um, has been visually action. I, I just, I, I don't know what else to say about him. There's not any real substance to the Punchestown win because they went so slow and he's beaten a couple of mares that, well, the Model Kingdom is what she is, a kind of a 140 mare and um, she could be anything, just, you know, didn't handle the, the tight track uh, two mile trip in her front. So uh, I don't know, to me, the Mullins crowd would know an awful lot more than anyone else um, with him. Just to do have to make a correction on Gaelic Warrior, I said last week he had a back operation. No, he didn't. I've since been corrected by... Um, connections on this routine oh. um, maintenance work on his back is all that he's had so maybe the jumping won't be sorted out with him um but the one i, I i've been with kind for a while now and i'm quite happy to stick with him is um good land he's just a horse that does things right he's very professional um i thought he was the most impressive maiden hurdle winner of the season nearly at leopard town at christmas and in the sense that visually he was good but he also beat horses that have a bit, a bit of substance to them uh, the likes of Embassy Garden, who I know may not be a fan of, but he is a, he is up to a certain level, and, and the Jiggenstown horse, um, who ran well in Clonmel afterwards, and then I just thought the two six in the Nathaniel Lacey stretched him a little bit. He, he was quite keen, but he, he managed to tough it out well, found plenty, and um, bear form that possibly isn't anything to get too excited about. But then is there anything in the race that's the bear with the bear form is amazing? So no, I I'd be quite keen on Good Land here. I've been with him for a while, and I'm more than happy to stick with him. Okay, currently nine to two with Ball Sports. Agree, Barry, or is this a race that we could take a swing with a horse at a bigger price, maybe? No, I'd agree with a lot of Tony says. Uh, Hermes Allen, I would have a question mark about him. I'm not just fully convinced about the, the Challow Hurdle, and it's a bad uh, guide to Cheltenham because in the, the 30 odd runnings of it, there's never been a festival winner come out of it in any of the novice races. So it's not a great uh, oh. starting point for, for, the, for anyone there. But uh, it was a good performance, but I just questioned the strength of the form, and as Tony mentioned, the race fell apart a bit. Um, of the others, Imperia Pass, very impressed him at Punchestown, and it'll be interesting to see which Paul rides because he has the option of Gaelic Warrior. Who had mentioned earlier in the in the show um a few weeks back as one I would fancy for this and I would fancy but it has probably got a little bit stronger since then um but he's going to be better stepping up on trip I think slight question with him going right handed so it'll be important for whoever rides him to get plenty of cover and get something on your outside but um he went to one five three after winning the handicap a competitive handicap in Lepson last time so he has plenty of experience I don't think his jumping is as much an issue as maybe just the chance of going right and giving away possibly some of his chance maybe at the last or some or a hurdle late on when he hasn't got the cover that he might need so um but i think he's a big player it'll be just interesting to see which paul rides um and goodland i would fully respect as well but the biggest question mark could be over the favorite but i'd, I'd be happy with with gaelic warrior but as i say um it'd be interesting to see which one paul rides Okay, sticking with Gaelic Warriors, sticking to your guns. Barry, we will we will keep with you for the Brown Advisory. Up next, uh, we've got the unbeaten Jerry Colom at the top of the market, 9-4. to four. We've got the obviously very talented but fragile Sir Gerhard at 9-2. to two. The real whacker in there at 9-2. to two. He was sort of a bit of the forgotten horse, I felt, in this market for a long time, but not so much anymore. His price has shortened. Uh, uh, after that, Gaila Dominique, we've already talked about, obviously expect him to be seen over further. Ramilly's in there, same thing. Stage star, one for Nichols in here at 10 to 1 with Ball Sports. But Barry, um, are you with the unbeaten horse at the top of the market or, or do you think there's some talent emerging further down? Um, you'd have to respect Jerry Kalam. He's been very good today. I think he's six from six. Um was good in sand down over two and a half. He looked outpaced at one stage, but he finished off really well. Um, Balco Coastal, though, I thought ran like a horse who possibly needed the run. So I'm not just fully convinced about the strength of that form, but Jerry Cologne will be better up and trip. Um, I'm not also fully convinced that he needs it as soft as people might think. I think um, the trip will suit him well. So he's probably, he's the right favourite, um, but I'd be happy to oppose him with Sir Gerhard. 
I just think Sagard stepping up. If he goes here, stepping up the three mile is going to suit his style of jumping. He wasn't the scopiest hurler in the world. Um, apart from taking that one chance at uh, at a fencing gore, and he did jump well. He's been very economical, which would suit going up and trip. He could be measured, just pop away, pop away. But he's a Ballymore winner. He's a bumper winner. He's the classiest horse in the race. Um, and he has lots of experience as in he ran the point to point he'd have been really well schooled for that so albeit he's only had one run over fences he's had a lot of practice in his early career as a point to pointer so um, I'm really really he's a lot, he's arse and, and sweet on at a nice price um, I would respect the real whacker um, two really good performances last couple of runs um, but I think this will be a step up again Intriguing I kind of thought as I was asking the question you were going to side with Jerry Colomb given that you've ridden him at home haven't you? I have, yeah, I rode him last week. Lovely horse. And that, that confirmed what I was thinking as a guard's um, ground. It's more, when I watched him in Limerick, I thought, oh, this lad loves a bog. But no, he's he's actually, he's, he's, he's nimble enough when you're, when you're on his back. So I think um, the trip is what he wants more so than the ground. Well, that is very interesting. We like that insight on the show. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, on to you, Tony, for the Brown Advisory. Are you as keen on Sir Gerhard as Barry is? Yeah, I've actually done a bit. Of, I I've done a bit of a vote face on this race. I, I do kind of like Sir Gerhard now. That I've looked at it again. Um, I think Jerry Colom is probably at his floor in terms of price. He, he surely can't go an awful lot short. Or um, the ground would be a worry for me. Gordon Elliott, I think, spent the early part of, part of his career, you know, wondering about whether he would handle decent ground. And then when he ran on quite decent ground, Taurus, he get jarred up after it. So it would be a concern for me. And the, the form of his two runs is, is nothing out of the ordinary. I don't really see it with the real whacker. Um, the horse he beat at Gordon Elliott's in the good breeze. He doesn't want to go by anyway on his initial chase run at Cheltenham. And then the race that he won, the dipper, he did that well. Um, though Mon Morale has just been disappointing since and doesn't really give any substance to the form. I do think this is a pretty poor race and I'm going to play the man here a bit um, Willie Mullins more so than the horse as, as anything else but um, the fact that he's running Sir Gerhard here off one run I'm going to take that as a plus as Barry's mentioned Sir Gerhard has been a real Cheltenham horse over the years like, sent off 2-1 to one for a bumper um, what was he 8-11 to 11 or 4-6 or something for a Ballymore one the two of them like he's 4-5 to 1 for this and this is a fairly weak race and also the fact that they're kind of um Privilege him, privileging him over Gaillard de Mani, who's a solid kind of one five five horse probably. And I think that he's a better chance of winning this. I, th I think that's a, a point or two. So Gaillard, it wouldn't be a massively strong winner, but I have it a small bet on him now in the last day or two, um, and I do think he has the potential to shorten a bit from his current four five one price. Okay, brilliant. Two votes for Sir Gerhard then. Um, on we go, Tony, and we will stick with you to what could be one of the races of the meeting because we get to see Inergamine versus Edward Stone again and Editor G as well. Uh, Edward's in, in the champion chase. Edward Stone is 7-4 to at the top of the market. Inergamine 7-4. to uh, Editor G at 6 is Gentleman Demi 8. Blue Lord 9. Nube Negra 20. Grenatine 25-1. to uh, But the real focus of all the Cheltenham Festival preview nights has been everyone trying to pin their colours to the right mast here when it comes to those top two in Ogamine and Edward Stone. I am team Edward Stone. I am sticking to this. I can't, I can just see that he's going to get the better of uh, an Ogamine again. And Tony, I want you to confirm my thoughts, please. Uh, yes, probably. Uh, I haven't <laughs> fully decided on this race yet. Um, and you don't have to fully decide. No, we're still 10 days out and you can, you can still have a little wait and see there's, there's no great panic with doing that there are plenty of opinions for him but not all of them I will be with one of the English horses I think whether it be Edward Stone or Editor De Gite. Um I think Edward Stone shaped like the best horse in the Clarence house had a lot of ground to make up was coming off you know not an ideal preparation for it um, but I wouldn't dismiss Gary Moore's horse out of hand completely um, the last two starts, he, he's done things very well. I am against an argument at the moment. I, I didn't really see any excuse for him um, in the January race. I thought, yeah, the mistake at the last accentuated his margin of defeat, but he, he was beaten at the time. And yeah, I, I think either Edward Stone or Edward Jeet would be the way I'm leaning, but still haven't fully decided. Okay, we will allow you that, Tony. What about you, Barry? Have you decided on the champion chase yet? Yeah, well, I'm going the opposite. Um, I thought Editor De oh. did well to win the Clarence House. Uh, I thought the new car suited him really well. He got the run of the race too. It was a good performance and I got a brilliant ride as well. But um, I think on the old course, sharper track, 
I'm not convinced that he would be the one to beat. Um, and likewise, Edward Stone, great run on the Clarence House, came from way off the pace. Um, good run, but I'm, I'm just, I just always love to learn an argument. I don't think he even showed his best uh, form when winning the championships last year. He was better when he went to Punchestown and won there. Um, he ran like a horse who needed a run in the Clarence House for me. He th- was very keen, very fresh, got a little bit tired, missed the last, when tired. Um, he's the paciest horse in the race. Um, and I think the old course will suit him best. Um, and for me, yeah, he, he he's, he's the one I'd want to be on. Oh, and maybe a little each way. I have maybe a little each way on Gentleman to Me with his run that he put in at Leopardstown. Uh, does well in the spring, so he's, he seems to be horse coming back to form. So he could be the each way option, but uh, no, I'll stick with an argument. You're a good man, Barry, for sticking with your opinions from earlier on in the season. I, I, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, as in, like, is it not healthier to be able to have new evidence and change your view? Well, so we'll know in two weeks' time whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, Vanessa. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Back in my box, Vanessa. On we go, Barry. Cross country chase. Delta work versus Galvin. Delta work. Even money to win the race again. Galvin in there at twos. Franco de Port seven to one. Uh, goodbye, Sam ten. Snow Leopard S at sixteens. Back on the last sixteens to all, of course, with ball sports. Those are the prices as we record. Um, the market suggests it really is between Delta work and Galvin. Is that the way you view it? And what's the inside track from the yard, Barry? Yeah, that is the way I'd view it. Uh, Delta Walk ran really well behind back in the last. I think he was given sixteen pound or so. Uh, really good run. But Galvin does good. Does good vibes on his schooling. Um, he was fourth in last year's Gold Cup. He beat Apple Letard only what sixteen? No, no, fourteen months ago in at Christmas in Leopardstown. So, um, I'd take a chance on Galvin. He's the classier horse. Um, I respect Delta Walk done really well in these races. But no, I I I take a punt on Galvin. Tony, is the cross-country race a race you've had much luck in in the past? No, I, I just don't really study these races, each their own and all that. It just wouldn't be something I'd look at. That is fair enough. I feared that might be the question, the, the answer there. As a result, Tony, we will stick with you for the champion bumper. Um, obviously, it's just incredibly hard to work out, uh, but it's for me is 100 to 30, up at the top of the market, a dream to share at 4 to 1, fun, fun, fun at 7 to 1. Sh- chapeau de soleil? At eights, I love crucifying that horse's name. Uh, Factor file at tens, better days ahead tens, Western Diego at tens as well. Tony, have you gone for a deep dive into the champion bumper yet? Would you believe I actually did the race today and I, I did have a right good look at this. I think a right good look at it. Very um, good. So I might chat about this for a bit. Um, wrong favourite, I'd say. I'd say the JP McManus horse should be favourite. Um, the yeah. it's for me horse uh, market was probably crying out for Willie Mullins horse at the time to jump to the top of it I think looking back on it now he was visually absolutely brilliant don't get me wrong and I think his, his section and state were, were very good as well I was reading today I was Simon Rowan's on the website but you know the, the horses in behind don't look at out of the ordinary on subsequent exploits and I think um, I think the John Cayley horse now I, I probably undervalued him at the time now how impressive he was and, and how much he achieved um, at Leopardstown, he was really good at Tipperary on his initial start. Um, beat horses with form there too. You know the the Rat Gold Boy had run on Kane entry before that, and Sir Argus, while well, he's a bit of a rogue, would have a level of form there too. Um, Roscommon just a total mess of a race. Uh, very steadily run, he did well to win it, but he's come up there to Leopardstown against race fit horses. He he's got a penalty. His jockey can't claim. And he, he's just done it really well. I love the way now when um, John Gleeson gave him a small bit, of, come off the bridle briefly in the thorn end, straight back on it, uh, pulled clear with fact to fail, pulled a long rate clear of Farinelli, who ran to, to Maya very well over Musselburn yesterday in a, in, a, in a graded novice hurdle, first time out over hurdles. Fact to fail, uh, Mullins crowd saying that he came on an awful lot from Christmas. So to me, he's very much deserving of favouritism. And the fact that um, JP Horse was second. They must have a bit of an opinion of fact to fail that they went then and bought a dream to share. So I, I think he's a fairly solid favourite. Um, I, I probably finish up having something on him anyway. Um, there's a few there. I don't really like this chasing them up in the. Ma- I, I don't really like that better days ahead, and I don't like that Ricci horse that ties in with him. Chapeau de Soleil. Um, better days ahead was kind of caught out in the speed test up and down right, and then he went to Fairy House Hatton's Grace Day when the very slow ground seemed to suit him. Bit of a massive race, very slowly run, and 
the, the Ricci horse, I, I don't know, I'm not seeing it with this horse at all. Like, he looked a very, very tricky ride that day. I know the comparisons were made with Fernie Hollow, but Fernie Hollow had um, had three starts before the champion bumper to get him kind of straightened out. This horse will be going straight there. So I, I think both those are taking up a bigger chunk of the market than ideally would be the case. Of the other Mullins horses, um, I was quite impressed with Western Diego and Nace. He might be a little bit more of a stay but he did travel well through that race. And I'd say the version of Richard O'Brien's horse, Sutton's Hill, that he beat was better than the one um, It's For Me beat. I also like that locked Lynn of Mullins is that was um, beat Firefox at Nace back in December. Thought he had a right good attitude now. Um, they, they had a great battle the whole way up the straight and they pulled an awful long way clear of the tour of Firefox since gone on and won a nav and bumper. Very impressed with it. Locked in now, the price is interesting. Gordon Elliott is a couple of horses, but on about this, no time to wait for a bit. Um, again, he, he was very good up at Down Royal. I just wonder what his, his mentality for this would be like. The road him now, like a horse that wanted to settle first time out at Leperstown over Christmas. So, whether he, he'd handled Cheltenham at this stage of his career, I don't know. Um, but he, he's certainly a horse I think that will prove quite good in the long term if, if they can keep his head screwed on so yeah re really interesting champion bumper um, Dream to Share is very solid and there's one or two others there that bigger price would definitely be given a chance to Love it an in-depth look at the champion bumper and a keen nod to a Dream to Share and wouldn't that be a hell of a story Barry? Oh, definitely, yeah, and I agree with Tony completely on it. Uh, brilliant performance. He was the one I had come down on, um, as the one you'd want to be on. Um, of the others, it, it's a very, very competitive race, and Willie has a has a stack load of them. And the first string is now is the the winner. We've seen him win it with third and fourth strings in the past, so difficult enough to know which one of those to be on. But the bumper itself, though, you know, it's it's they're they're a fragile bunch. If you like, you don't know who's going to you know who's going to um behave on the day or who will get worked up and get get over excited and could have the race room by the time we get to the start but I dreamed um Better Days Ahead, sorry, Tony was, was mentioned him. I had the pleasure of him during the week too and liked him, did a nice piece of work, but above all, very relaxed. So if you're looking for a horse for an each way punt, I thought he was a one who could be worth a little look because the the the, the occasion definitely won't phase this fella. Very relaxed, did a good piece of work. Um, you could question his form, but he beat Chapel to side. He beat him comfortably. Chapel to side, there's been plenty of talk about him all the way through since then, and I'm sure he would improve a lot for the run. Um, but no, I like better days ahead um, for a little each way play, but I would, the favourite is definitely the one you'd want to be on. Okay. Brilliant. Um, Barry, let's move on to Thursday and we can kick off with the Turners where Mighty Potter is the hot pot here, the five to four favourite. Bambridge, seven to two, appreciate it, four to one. Sir Gerhard, we've already spoken about in a different race. Balco Coastal at 10, Stage Star 10s, Journey With Me 10s. Uh, those are the prices with ball sports and a lot of pressure, a lot of eyes will be on this lad, Mighty Potter. He's got a huge fan club already. Uh, how is he at home, Barry? Did, did you get the pleasure of him, really? That's actually the big question well I did before the Dublin Racing Festival but they, they didn't have me back on him yet anyway um, <laughs> but no he was very he, he was very good in Leopardstown he was very good in the Drinmore you know he's, he's a classy horse he's a grade one novice hurdler he's a big horse with a, with a massive future so no he's he is the one you'd want to be on um, but of the others I think appreciated Banbridge there isn't much between them and, and maybe there's a little bit of favouritism for Banbridge but Banbridge got up to beat appreciated a nose when behind El Fabiolo um, at the Dublin Racing Festival over two mile. Now, for me, appreciated race closer to the pace and paid the price for that. Um, I think the step up and trip, I'd mentioned him um, a few weeks ago on the show. He was one I was fancying for this race at a little bit of a price. So I think he's probably good value each way. Um, and I'd like to think he, he'd reverse, reverse placings with um, Banbridge just because he could be ridden a little bit more conservatively over a trip. Um, and I think he will enjoy the two and a half. Um, he is a classy horse. I know he's a nine-year-old, but he did miss a season. And there's a big question with nine-year-olds don't win novice chases. But we probably don't see many nine-year-olds in these novice chases. Um, and especially one with the, with the level of ability he has shown in the past. Okay, currently four to one with ball sports. Tony, are you looking anywhere other than the favourite as the winner of this uh, race? I haven't fully decided on this race yet. Um, one thing I would say, but appreciate it. I wonder did he run back a little bit quick at Leopardstown? Like he had only started um, his chase career at the same this gallop in the Champ one um, that John Dorkin, another run raced, another run at Leopardstown. Um, possibility there might be a little bit more in him. Shape of the race sets up like you could back appreciate it or Bambridge each way, but I, I just think probably the favourite will hold sway. He just has that 
little bit of brilliance about him um, that maybe the other two don't. I think visually he was excellent at the Dublin Racing Festival, but um, no, I, I haven't just fully decided on this. It's one race I want to have another little look back on. Yeah, I'm a big Banbridge fan, especially at this trip and round chanting on some spring ground, but I just fear that Mighty Potter has a class edge over a couple of these in here, including Banbridge. Um, let's move on to the Ryanair, where many people's banker of the festival runs. That is, of course, Shishkin, 8-11 to 11 with Ball Sports. Fury Road in there, next best, 9-2. to 2. Blue Lord, 9-2. to 2. Janadil, 15-2. to 2. Envoy Allen at 10s. Uh, Fakir de Diaries at 11-1. to 1. And French Dynamite at 4 14s. Um, let's start with you, Tony, here. Can anything beat Shishkin if he reappears in that Ascot form that we saw him in last time out? No, nothing will beat him if he returns up in the in the form of Ascot or, or, or the form of some of his other performances over the years. It's just whether will he or, or will he not. Uh, I'd say there's a, there's a chance that he will um, regress a little bit off the back of that. He did have a hard race in Ascot. I would define a hard race as the fact that he ran fast and, and he did run very fast. Um, he was the only one able to maintain the gallop um, when the others had kind of cried enough. And um, the overall time I know was, was, was pretty impressive. <sighs> then he was trying the trip and he has the, for the first time and he has a little bit of history of, of a problem or two. He's kind of a horse that I would like to maybe bypass for the race altogether because he can underperform and still win. I'm going to try and do something around there, maybe without market on the place market here on Janadil. I think there's a few flaky customers now between Janadil and Shishkin in the market, like Fury Road um, is coming off a really good effort at the Dublin Racing Festival, but but he's tricky to put it politely. Um, history kind of a breeding problem. He <laughs> wouldn't always wouldn't always be wanted to back it up. So I, I don't know, but him, Blue Lord is coming off a, a, a kind of a flat run at the Dublin Racing Festival. And Vi Allen, you, you just wouldn't know what you're going to get with him. Whereas Janadil, good run, good win back in Goran. Um, the fact that it wasn't a really strongly run race, you know, didn't really test his fitness too much is probably a plus with a few to coming on for his. I think he'd probably ridden for a place. So I think he could be one to hit the frame anyway, and I'm somewhat interested in him. Yeah, okay, at 15 to 2. It's interesting, Tony, that you say there that Shishkin could underperform and still win this race. And I, I know what you're saying, but in a way, I kind of feel like he's one of those horses that he either. Uh, is there bang on form and wins or he can just put in a stinker and when things don't go right with him whether it's the connections plan or not it's kind of it, it's a bit all, all or nothing I think is how I view Shishkin would I be right in saying that Barry do you think I'm not so sure Vanessa I think we've seen too much of all of Shishkin to worry about the little bit that hasn't showed up um He's only disappointed twice, you know, and he was really good at Ascot. Uh, there's no reason for me, I don't think there's any reason why he shouldn't back it up. Um, it's hard to oppose him, and it's hard to even find what you'd, what you'd be betting um, in the each market. I'd agree with what Tony said of Fury Road. He was half a length in front of Franco de Porte at Christmas. You know, that's that's nowhere near that level for me anyway. Um, Janadil is probably the best of them if the Goran run hasn't just come too soon. If he needed to run that day, it's a quick enough turnaround for this. But he's the only one, I think, with the potential to trouble him. Um, if Blue Lord was to return to his Christmas farm, he'd definitely be one who could chase him home. But he was very disappointing last time. So there's question marks about them all. But I'd have the smallest question mark over Shishkin. He'd, he'd, he'd do for me. Okay, viewers out there and listeners out there, is Shishkin your banker of the meeting? Do get involved in our comment section below on the YouTube channel. Uh, we like to read them all and hear your views, Shishkin or not. Uh, Barry, let's stick with you for the stairs hurdle, which typically looks an incredibly wide open race. So many cases to be made right the way down the betting, but it's Blazing Carl, who's currently top of the betting at nine to four. Tiupu in there at four to one. Mary's Rock in there nine to two, if she goes there. Home by the Lee, 11 to two. Flooring Porter at sixes. Classical Dream at nine to one. Gold Tweet, the French horse at tens. Paisley Park, 14 to one. And Ashdale Bob, 14 to one with ball sports. But Barry, I dissect this and then this is lit that is literally the intro to this race I gave 12 months ago when it was just as much of a muddling contest as it is this year different horses in there but my goodness cases to be made left right and center 
Yeah, I think it's a stronger race this year than last year. Um, Blazing Cal has been very good, um, but his form, you know, it, it, he's been impressive, but he has to step up. He hasn't taken the scalp of what some of these have taken. Um, so, albeit he's impressive, he still has to step up. He's, he's four from four over hurdles. Uh, Tia Hupu was really good in Gorn. He was really good in the Hatton's Grace. Um, a little bit like Jerry Kalam as well. He surprised me when I was on him, how he, I don't think he's going to be as ground dependent as much stamina dependent. Um, so he would be the one for me to beat. Um, home of the Lee, I'm still not convinced with. He dashed El Bob three lengths behind him in the Dublin Racing Festival. Um, Florian Porter didn't turn up that day, so I'm not sure about the strength of that form. Um, he was beaten seven lengths in the race last year. I think it's a stronger race I mentioned this year, so I wouldn't be so sure about him. Florian Porter hasn't had the ideal prep for this, um, and he generally needs his first run. So if he's had a few issues um, since Christmas, and he has been held up. Um, I just wonder, will he be as fit as Gavin would like to have him? Um, Classical Dream is another one who I believe there was issues with as well. I was fancying him on the back of his run in the Hatton's Grace, just because he was more relaxed on that day, where the preliminaries were always an issue for him. Um, he seemed more relaxed in the in the Hatton's Grace. He raced nicely, um, albeit he got beaten by Tia Hoop and was beaten the neck. Um, to you who was stalking him and Classical Dream was stalking Honeysuckle so Paul's hand might have been played a little bit earlier than he would have liked maybe um, so if he was to turn up in the level of form he showed at the Hatton's Grace um, I think he could be value but I think Tia Hupu is the one I want to be on Okay, Tiupu at four to one against the favourite Blazing Carl at nine to four. Tony, over to you for the stairs is this a race that you have had a bit of time to focus in on yet? That's absolutely brilliant, Barry. I'm glad to hear to you who's going to handle the ground because <laughs> I think if he goes, he'd go very hard on this. Um, uh, Jiz, Vanessa, you're, you're very harsh on this race. Uh, this race is different level to that, that disaster show last year. Um, this race just gets <laughs> str stronger and stronger. Um, like I, I've been a Tupo fan for, for a good while now, um, but you have got Blazing Cal added to the mix. You've got Mary's Rock added to the mix. Now you've got another bloody French horse added to the mix. Um, they've obviously seen that gold tweet um was able to win and they're, they're thinking of sending another one over so a really really deep race um and to me streets ahead of what there was there last year um blazing cal again i would agree with barry saying there he he, he has to step up he, he he's obviously well suited to the track he's going the right way but he does have to step up um i would be worried about mary's rock running she, she's a danger to them all the form that she's been in over the last um year or more but she is quite free and whether a real slug of three miles would suit her I, I'm, I'm not quite so sure i think tupo's got the best form i think the happens grace is the best form i think beating classical dream when that horse is fresh is a hell of a performance i don't think classical dream stays three miles i think he's better two and a half i think he didn't stay it last year um in this race in a stoley run race he just about gets away with it in punches down but the race in punches down is like two seven and a bit um and i think beating him is excellent performance out of tupo and then he's gone to goran and he's won easily. It wasn't much of a race, but give some degree of confidence that, that he would be um, staying the three miles. I actually think he's going to be better over the three miles. Um, he is like Jerry Kalam in some ways, but like, Tupu's never kind of got jarred up on the ground, which Jerry Kalam has, and um, he has handled it to a degree the, the day he won in the ace. So look, I, I, I'm not as confident as I was maybe after Christmas when when it looked quite, kind of quite a tin race, there's two or three very dangerous horses are parachuted into it, but I'd still be making Tupu my selection. Okay, two votes for Tupu and the boys putting me rightly back in my box on this show, talking absolute rubbish. And uh, yeah, I, I take all those comments on board in fairness. Uh, Tony, should we move on to the Mayor's Novices race where Lucia is the six to four favourite? Now this was a race where a horse needed to put their hand up and sort of put in a bit of a standout performance. And that's what Lucia seemingly did when we last saw her. And as a result, she is quite a short price favourite at six to four. Ashrow Diamond next best, 100 to 30, night and day at sevens. A lot of joy in there at eight to one, and you wear it well at ten to one, along with Magical Zoe too, an interesting contender. But Tony, we will stick with you for this race. Do you have a strong opinion in this? I do have a bit of an opinion in this. Um, Ashwood Diamond, there's one. I just think it's kind of a one thirty-five mare, and maybe that will be good enough. But I just don't think it will. Um, I think there's one or two in this that are open to more kind of progress. The other Mullins ones in it. Um, lot of joy you'd be hoping she would be running up to a platform to give her a chance in this i think what she's done over hurdles wouldn't give her any chance really at the moment she's no better than the 125 mayor um night and day is open to progress 
but very inexperienced and that caught Dana Blue out in this race big time last year and um, she's looking for a big chaser as well um, just wonder now is she sharp enough for this Lucia is chances there for all to see she's unbeaten she's visually very good but I prefer that the price is kind of a uh, mare that I'd call Lucia light um, and that's magical Zoe because she's got quite a similar profile to Lucia in that she's unbeaten and she's visually been brilliant like, her bumper win there last year in Cork, like uh, unbelievable visual performance, kind of a, a very um, inexperienced rider riding her. It just looked like she was, she was riding an absolute steering job, and she was told just take your time and this this mare will carry you through and bolted up. Um, same story went to Wexford. Um, up just one, was won both these races on the bridle. Now has beaten absolutely nothing in, in either of those wins, but the visuals were were, were amazing. Um, and then she goes to down Royal, and there is real substance to that performance. I think um, I thought the horse, you know, she, the mare, sorry, she got Adrian Heskin out of trouble from two out. Um, she got a bit of a bump there, but the way she quickened up was was really really sharp. Um, and that was a deep race in behind that. You, you had a load of one twenty five, one thirty mares, kind of uh, filling the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place. What you have, you'd uh, the Model Kingdom, you'd Liberty Dance, you'd Sailor V, you'd Rioja Choice. All mares that have kind of run well or won kind of graded listed races, good races since. And to me, Magical Zoe was much the best now that day. She also has the run style of a horse now that would suit this race. To me, the dawn run is like the county hurdle. Um, if you're in the first the, the first five or six at halfway, you haven't got a hope. It's just very, very difficult. Uh, just seems to ride like that every year. So she's, she's a hold up mare. You, you just drop her out right for a bit of luck. Um, and I think 10 to 1 about her is quite a good bet at the moment that I've backed her. Brilliant. That is music to my ears, Tony. She was the horse that I landed on in this race. Not going into it in anywhere near as much detail of you, of course. So that, yeah, just just what I wanted to hear. Magical Zoe at 10 to 1 currently. Barry, can you beat that at a price in this race? Well, to start off, I do I do like Lachia and I think she'll be very hard to beat. She's been very impressive on all starts, both bumpers and hurdle races. Um, so no, I would be sweet on her, but I would agree with Tony and Magical Zoe. Definitely one with a big chance. That was great for him in down Royal. And I thought maybe you were it well, uh, who was second to Hermes Allen in the Chalo. Uh, went down then, had a good run in Sandown after that. Um, I thought it was one for each other play as well. So those, those are the two to me, but uh, I think the favourite would be hard to beat. You wear it well is 10 to 1, Magical Zoe is 10 to 1, and Lucia, the favourite, 6 to 4 with Ball Sports. That wraps up day three of our preview show. Uh, what do you agree or disagree with that's been said so far, viewers and listeners out there? Please do get in contact. Let's move on to Friday, Barry, and we will stick with you for the triumph hurdle. Um, looks like a clash between your your the horse you've been such a fan of the whole way along in Blood Destiny, 7 to 4, Lossy Mouse, 7 to 4, Gala Masso at 5 to one comfort zone at 10 zenta in there at 16 seems a big price uh bo zenith at 16s as well all with ball sports as things stand right now but surely barry you can't be abandoning blood destiny now no definitely not um i suppose gala marceau was probably a little bit fortunate to win in leprosy when lossy boat got stuck in traffic so um i think it is a match it's, it's it's a dead match between the two of those um and it'll be interesting to see which paul townend rides lossy mouth or blood destiny um obviously i've been a big fan of blood destiny and he's done nothing wrong to to think i should be uh, thinking any other ways um there's a good vice from both ruby and david casey on the, the on the preview circuit on Blood Destiny and it kinda got a stronger impression on him than Lossy Mouth maybe or maybe I was uh maybe one that's what I wanted to hear possibly but um no I'd be <laughs> really sweet Blood Destiny. I like him as an individual. I think he's gonna be well suited. We mentioned earlier on about the new course stamina based. I think that's gonna really suit him. Lossy Mouth has won um it'd be unfair to say sprints but definitely there were there were more pacey finishes um in Ferias and earlier in Leopardstown at Christmas showed a lot of pace and when you have that level of pace there's always a question mark how well will you see it out but for me blood destiny is really robust jumps really well and to me would see it out really well so now i'd be i'd be happy to stick with blood destiny and maybe a little each way um on uh, comfort zone plenty of good course form in Cheltenham on the trails day was a winner at chepstow the grade one there Um, he could be next best of the rest 
Okay, if he lines up there, yeah, comfort zone at 10 to 1 currently uh, for the Joseph O'Brien yard. Tony, is it uh, is it fair to say that it is a match between uh, Blood Destiny and Lossy Mouth, or am I being a bit rude to the rest of the field? Yeah, there's one or two of the others there have a chance, but I'd agree with an awful lot of what Barry has said there. I wouldn't be convinced Tony will go off now and raid uh, Blood Destiny all the same. Very rare for jockeys now to get off the horse with the proven great proven graded form which she has um, versus Blood Destiny is coming out of maybe just more ordinary novice races but no I, I'd still be keen on Blood Destiny albeit the price is absolutely smashed to pieces at this stage <laughs> smashed to pieces at 7-4 to four. Yeah, that's a fair comment and do you guys out there agree please do let us know are you on Blood Destiny as Barry and Tony are uh, Tony I'm delighted that it's fallen that I get to keep with you for the Albert Bartlett because take it away sir in regards to Corbett's Cross who's currently 100-30 to 30, and this is the horse who when we spoke last week I've literally never heard you be this positive about any horse on the show over is it three seasons now? Yeah, three, nearly three seasons, I suppose. Yeah, ah, look, look. Hopefully, he's gonna go, he's gonna pitch up here now. I wouldn't think that's an absolute certainty, but um, yeah, he was a bit overpriced this time last week for the race. Uh, he shortened up a bit since then. Um, JP McManus has bought into him. Uh, wouldn't blame him both in the near term and the long term. Look, looks a serious prospect. As I mentioned last week, I just don't think there's anything else in the race that would have had the ability to do what he did at Nice. Um, the week before last, uh, just a, a display of raw kind of ability and jumping and travelling and, and doing everything right. So there, there's others there that, that have chances. I, I had a few quid on Favori to Sean Do after Christmas. Still would, would, would give him a bit of a chance. Um, his form got a decent boost when the Cromwell horse came out and actually bolted up in the maiden afterwards. Um, but, but it is kind of a, outside the Corpus Cross, it is very wide open, but hopefully Corpus Cross will pitch up and give me something to shout about on the Friday. Nice. Is this not the race, though, that you picked Barry up on in terms of Barry saying it's not a very deep or competitive race and now you're saying that it's all no, about no, Corbett's no, Cross hold too? No, hold on. I, I'm saying I find it an interesting race. <laughs> it may, may, maybe not an absolutely brilliant race. I, I, I kind of like these races that, well, sometimes I like them that are, appear to be complicated. Sometimes you can find OK bets in them. But, um, yeah, the, the horse has put his head above, as, as Barry was mentioning. Hopefully he'll stay above. Okay, is Corbett's Cross the superstar in here against some mere mortals, Barry? Oh, I think so. And, and that was my, my view through the season as regards the Albert Barton. It was mere mortals. So they're a good bunch, but you know, for me, there wasn't a superstar. But there's a superstar now, presuming he goes here. Um, you know, Emmett Mullins mentioned after his last win that he would need to need a bit of juice in the ground, if you like. So how the ground will be by Friday, who knows at this stage. But um, he's definitely, he's he is the class horse of the race and probably a good investment um, for a horse for the future because I think he has a big one. Um, but my view of the race all the way through was probably along the lines you could run it five times and get five different results because between Embassy Gardens, Three, Star, uh, Three Card Bragg, um, Monty Star, Hidden Valley Lake, there was none of them were head and shoulders above the others. So um, I think it's an open race in the places, but uh, if Corbus Cross turns up, there's only one winner. Okay, just so I didn't even read, I was so excited about this race, I didn't even read the betting out. But Corbett's Cross is 130, three car brag is six to one, next best in the betting, and Embassy Garden is sixes as well. Hidden Valley Lake in there at eights, just so you know. Uh, Barry, let's stick with you and go on to the Gold Cup. This is it. This is the big race of the week. Many people view this as the absolute big race of the season, of course. And Gallop in Deschamps is 6-4 to four at the top of the betting. Brave Man's Game, 13-2. to two. A Plutard, 7-1. to one. Noble Yates, sevens is Statler, 8-1. to one. Conflated at 10-1. to one. Protectorat at 12-1. to one. Ahoy Senor is Senor at 14s. Um, my goodness gracious me, what a gold cup this could be. I just think it's an absolute belter of a renewal of this race. Oh, definitely. It's a quality race. Um, but Gallop and the Champ, he's, I think he just could be a little bit better than the rest and probably more than a little bit better. Um, we discussed last week the possibility of where would the pace be coming from. We mentioned maybe a high senior, but it doesn't look like it's going to be an end-to-end -end gallop. So if there is a question mark about his stamina, um, it won't be tested to the level that it could be in other years. Um, so he is going to be, he's the one to beat. And I think he's going to be very, very hard to beat. And probably isn't bad value at the price he's at with the level of form he's shown. 
um, and the potential he has going forward. So no, I think he is a proper superstar. Um, of the others, it's probably tricky enough. Like if Brave Man's game, I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon now with him. Albeit he won the King George, he's yet to prove it on a track like Cheltenham. So I'd have to watch him. A Plutard, last year's winner. He's a long way to come after bombing out at Haydock, then a non-runner at Christmas and hasn't been seen since. So it'll be difficult to make a case there. Um, Noble Yates will have cheek pieces back on, have more of them to win the Grand National. So there could be a little bit of improvement in him. Um, I like Statler as an each way play maybe. Um, there was a question mark about him getting the trip last year in the, the National Hunt chase and he got it that day, but he likes good ground. The race is going to be run, I think, at a stronger pace, obviously, than it was at the Dublin Racing Festival, which I think will suit him. Uh, Cheltenham will suit him as well. So I think he has a chance. Um, a top protector at will probably want it softer, presuming it's going to be good with the way the forecast is looking. Um, it's a competitive race outside of the favourites, but I think the favourites are going to be very, very hard to beat. Tony, do you concur with those thoughts? Is the favourite as solid as Barry seems to think he is? Don't have any massively against the favourite bar the price, um, but I'm going to back the horse that I think has got the single best piece of form this season, staying chase form. Uh, that's Brave Man's game. Um, I just think the King George looked like a proper race. Um, Long press would have been, I'd say, quite a short price. I'd say clear second favourite for this race um, if, if he had remained well. And Brave Man's game, to me, was getting well on top of him at the last one that horse and seated. That was despite um, Brave Man's game having a very wide trip throughout. And it was possible that maybe going wide was an advantage in that in, in that race, but he still had to travel a long way and he had long press uh, jumping across him for, for the whole trip. Um, Paul Nichols has said that this is a different horse this season. The trainers, you know, tell a lot of stories to themselves and tell a lot of stories to owners and different things like that, but I think he's correct about this because visually it looks like on the track that he seems a different horse because he wouldn't have looked like a, a real robust uh, three mile stayer last season he would look maybe more of a fast horse but to me he, he came off the bridle before long press but as soon as Harry Cobden kind of niggled him on along he just really finished out his race very well um, that was a strongly run race unlike Gallop and the Champs at, at the Dublin Racing Festival that was a steadily run race and maybe he will be better over even further very possibly will but Brave Man's game to me at Kempton looked like a horse that will almost certainly be better over further. So I'm happy enough with him. Um, I think his price definitely is the scope to shorten. He shortened a bit there. He's kind of gone from 8 into 13 to 2 in the last week or so. Um, I just think it's hard for a horse that has won the King George so well to, to be this big of a price in the Gold Cup. I do like a horse uh, for the Gold Cup that is you know second season chase or coming out of novice chase that maybe hasn't got the the wounds or the scars maybe that horses that have run the race before have and he would be a little bit of a win only project I wouldn't have any interest in backing him each way because the trip is still a, a an unknown uh, and his adaptability to the track is a bit of unknown but I, I think in terms of form that we've seen recently this season he's the one that's a bit overpriced intriguing brave man's game at 13 to 2 do you agree or disagree viewers and listeners out there get involved in the comments box below i was going to tell you there that i was down at paul nicholas recently saw brave man's game and he was very confident about his chances but you guys all know out there and yourself barry and tony keenan that uh Paul would be confident about literally every runner he has at any racetrack anywhere in the country so that's not new news to anyone so I don't know why I've just wasted valuable time mentioning it Tony let's move on to the mayor's chase Allegor de Vassi is 6-4 to four at the top of the market Impervious in there at 13-8 to eight. Jeremy's Flame 5-1 to one. Magic Days 10s Dolcita in there at 16s the ever consistent Zambella at 16-1 to one. also another intriguing mayor's contest people might not like it but it could be a very interesting race this Tony yeah a race with the potential for drama I think any time um, Allegory de Vassi is in a race there's a potential for <laughs> something something queer to happen um, wouldn't really be uh, back or forth the prices would lead impervious but it, it wouldn't be the strongest uh, betting opinion I'd have of the week be any stretch okay fair enough we will allow that once again Barry over to you do you have a strong view in the mayor's chase yeah, well, they definitely look the best two in the race, uh, Allegory de Vassi and Impervious. Um, and Allegory de Vassi, you know, she's a high-class mare and she was brilliant over hurdles a little bit we saw of her, but her jumping is a big question mark. And to take on season performers, um, I think it's going to be tricky for her. So I'd be I'd be against her and I was really impressed at Impervious uh, beating Journey with me, but gi giving him a pound. Um, but 
gained a lot of valuable experience that day in Punchston over two and a half miles. Um, she was good in Cork as well first time. Yeah, I, th- I think she's she's the one to beat. Um, and as regards the each way market, it's it's hard to pick the one that'll chase them home. But uh, I'd be I'd be sweet and impervious and very much against Allegory de Bassi. Okay, fascinating. Impervious at 13 to 2 with balls pulls. That wraps up the main chunk of the show in terms of the grade one action that we were looking at over the four days. But of course, we can't do a chant festival preview show without taking a look at the handicaps. And that is where we head next. And look, it's tricky at this stage, Tony. We don't know who's going to go where and what's going to line up. But we have got the entries and the weights out now, so we can take a good enough look. What has jumped out of the page at you and what would you like to flag up to our viewers in terms of the handicaps, way to play it and the horses that have jumped out at you? Yeah, I, I won't labour this because as I mentioned last week or the week before, I, I don't really study these races until the 48 hour stage, but two Irish trained hurdlers that I would have a little bit of interest in. I don't know if there's any great urgency to back either of them because um, they're not the real horses that I think uh, would shorten. Um, over the next 10 days. The very man is one in the Coral Cup. He's an older horse. I do think he just wants dropping back to two and a half miles. Um, he's been stretched by three miles on a number of his recent hurdles run. He improved last summer through the flat. He won a charity race at Punchestown the week before last quite easily. I think the Coral Cup's a race that, that should suit him well. His trainer, I think, had four runners in it in recent years. Um, one at Super Sunday. And, Probably the best horse to wait last year with Ashdale Bob. And another one there in the county hurdle, um, a horse called Magna Glory, trained by Terence O'Brien. You could see him coming back into form there. He's a couple of winners in the last fortnight or so. Um, I think he's a horse that's really well suited by the um, test, I suppose, that the county hurdle provides stiff two, two miles. Um, his He won in Listowel now back in September, and Listowel really wouldn't be a place that I would have thought would suit him but the form of that race has worked out incredibly well and um, you know the winner actually out of it today if he stood there he's won the first at leperstown was, was second that day but there's a number of horses there in behind him you'd my mate mozzy ran very well in the flat after that afrenock phase has won a, a couple of three races since dad's lad won a chat them afterwards fina ardenza um went very close in a good race at nice afterwards i thought um magna glory was sort of better than the form winner there he, he didn't get a great run through the race um and yeah it, it provided he turns out if he turns up in the same kind of form as he was in the stole I, I would give him a bit of a chance in the county hurdle for all that you need the usual proviso with luck and running and all that okay and for tony's further in-depth views on handicaps of course stay tuned for the off the fence programs that will be coming to you the night before each race day during the Cheltenham festival so we'll be bringing you four shows ahead of the day's events the following day but barry over to you for your handicap picks has anything particularly jumped out at you at this stage this early stage yeah, run for Oscar um, was one that caught my eye. He was third, uh, two handicaps in soft ground since winning the Cesaro, which on good ground. Um, so he had his mark confirmed in Haydock when he was third in the Betfair hurdle. Um, so or the Betfair handicap over three mile that day, which is a no bad thing to have that mark confirmed in England rather than just get hoisted up when it comes to the festival. So I thought on better ground, um, run for Oscar, definitely of interest. Of the others, uh, I thought Imagine ran well behind Hunter's Yarn and Navin might have just caught the eye there, has the four runs. Um, I know Gordon Elliott mentioned it as one for the for the Martin Pipe, so that would be of interest. I thought Might I ran really well on Trials Day, went second in a two mile handicap, came from well off the pace, um, has options in the Carl, the Martin Pipe and the County. Um, he was one I liked in that race in Haydock, but just too keen over that trip. So, um, And one as well, Samuel Spade, who was second to Perseus Way in the Chatterns Fen, in Huntingdon, I thought that could have a squeak in the in the Boodles. He was a good winner since then, so um, one with a chance I thought. Okay, and just one thrown in from me would be San Salvador for the Joseph O'Brien Yard. I uh, wouldn't have the sort of sexy profile of horses that he'll be running against if he lines up in the Martin Pipe or he does have the Coral Cup option as well. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing A, where he does end up and B, watch him run. Um, I think he, yeah, he might not be 
the profile of some of the horses that are shorter than him in the betting, but I think he may be... Uh, I think he has a chance of running above his odds anyway. That would be my selection there in the handicaps at this stage. But we can move on to naps of the meeting and an each way bet too from the boys. Uh, I will come to you first, Tony. Who is the nap of the meeting for you and what is your each way bet of the meeting? Yeah, I just going to keep it simple with the nap. going to go with El Fabiolo. Uh, not so much an each way bet, but the one at bigger prices is, is Magical Zoe at the moment. Okay. Yeah, much bigger prices, 10 to 1. And Barry, over to you. Who is your nap and each way bet of the meeting? Well, Constitution Hill will be my own personal nap, but he's definitely in a betting proposition. Uh, Shishkin has gone a little bit the same direction with price too. So um, I'm sweet and honeysuckle over the trip. I think she's going to be very hard to beat, so she would be the one for me. Um, each way, I think, but Sir Gerhard, I think, is a great price at fives. <coughs> Excuse me, so I'd be I'd be happy with him. And I think Mr. Coffee each way in the in the National Chase. Okay, a couple of each way selections there. And for me, um, as El Fabiolo has already gone, I'll land on Mighty Potter, but it's pretty unoriginal in terms of my nap. Can't see either of those two being beat. Um, and my each way I would go with high definition in the Supreme. Um that about wraps up our show in terms of tips. But Tony, we will head over to you for the last word of the show. What advice do you give punters out there at this stage oh. going into the Cheltenham Festival? Well, there's no advice here. I'm just going to get in my soapbox as I've a tendency to do the day before the Cheltenham Festival. Um, <laughs> look, Cheltenham's, Cheltenham's a great sporting occasion, but it's also a great betting occasion. Uh, probably the best four days of the year for, for most of us. And betting's been getting a, kind of a real hard time now the, the, the last year or so. Um, and this kind of, I suppose, new Puritanism, I would call it, where, where a bet is kind of a grubby thing. Um, I, I don't like that, and I think done responsibly, like, like there's a great joy in betting and having a punt, and it's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. I, I think it was the um, the deceased racing post journalist Paul Hayes said it best, like, it improves kind of the flavour of life. You can think for yourself, you can have an opinion, and you can put money on it, um, and your views right of indicators are, are, are the aren't or you win money or you don't um, you have to put a bit of skin in the game and it's not just talk and, and there's something very pure about that like, so next week like, I, I'm going to give it a good go anyway um, and I'm sure lots of people do the same you get a chance to back your opinions have been built up now over the guts of six weeks um, and it's a great thing to do is think look forward to it and that's what I'm planning on doing anyway Brilliant, Tony. I love it. I like to hear it. And I'm with you. It's one of the great joys in life when you, like you say, have some skin in the game and you get rewarded and it can go either way. But it, it brings great joy to many people and it can really enhance a day and it will do for literally hundreds of thousands during the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, boys, thank you very much as always. I'm very much looking forward to the Cheltenham Festival week for many reasons, but none more so than, of course, I'll be joined by the boys the night before every day. So starting on the Monday all the way through we will be previewing the days one go at a time and it'll be in a short snappy show for you guys to watch and listen to ahead of the days racing during the Cheltenham Festival so watch out for those shows hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so that you don't miss a single episode of Off The Vents and you won't do want to for the reasons that I have just mentioned but for now Barry and Tony thank you very much as always that was Off The Fence that was our Cheltenham Festival preview show hopefully you've got some good snippets from it thank you very much for watching that was off the fence.